Hello, I'm Naz Campanella and I'm the ABC's National Disability Affairs Reporter. I'm blind and I'm also the mum of a very bouncy toddler named Lachlan. A year ago, the ABC started The Birth Project, where we received almost 4,000 stories about your experiences of pregnancy and birth. Many brought us to tears. You told us about injuries during delivery, interventions which led to trauma, and situations where you'd been given a lack of information, lack of information that you'd hoped for around the education you needed about birth and pregnancy. We wanted to thank you very much for sharing lots of your stories with us in the last year, but also thank you for posting some of your questions online to us in the last week. We wanted to unpack some more of this discussion, and to do that today, I am joined by the Australian Birth Stories podcast host, Sophie Walker. Sophie, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Ness. Lovely to talk to you again. Let's get started. Just tell us a little bit about who you are and who's in your family. Yep, so I'm a mother to three boys, and they're 10, 7, and 4. And um, yeah, we've got a busy household, but I've been running the podcast now for about six years. Yeah. And you're obviously speaking to thousands of women, so we're very lucky to have you here to share some of those experiences with us. So let's get into the nitty gritty of some of these questions that our listeners had for us. The first one is around what's considered the gold standard of maternity care? Yeah, well, evidence supports that the best outcomes for mother and baby is through a midwifery-led care model where you have the same midwife throughout your pregnancy and you have them present at your birth and ideally in your postpartum care as well. So we know that that is the best um, outcome for a positive birth experience for the mother, for um, more physiological birth experiences, less intervention and less overall trauma. So that's what we're working towards and yet it's only... um, depends which study you read, but um, my, the figures that I have is 8% of Australian women have access to that through the public system. Yeah, let's talk a bit about this idea of the postcode lotto when it comes to midwifery group practice, which is what it's called. What, How does that work? Because you often hear of it's, it's not available at every sort of hospital. I assume that in regional areas it's definitely um, not as more widely available as it might be, say, in the big cities. What have you heard about that from women? Yeah, it's really devastating. I mean, you and I live in big cities and we have more choices and we have done, and I was able to access that model of care through the public system. So I feel incredibly privileged, but what it's referring to is where you're based is which hospital you're zoned to. And sometimes like school zones, you're on the cusp and you have to kind of apply and see. And um, yeah, it's devastating that where you live dictates the level of care that you receive or, or the options you have. Some people don't have the option to then ask for a midwife wife for their um, duration of their care, or they perhaps want to have a home birth and that's not um, available to them in that area. So it's it's sort of a zoning thing and it's an access thing. And as you touched on, regional um, families have a lot lot less choice, unfortunately, and we're really hoping to see that change. I'm definitely hearing, even just in my circle of friends and and mothers groups, et cetera, that it is something that mothers are wanting more and more now. I know it is so hard to get into, though. I basically called my local hospital the minute I found out because I knew that I was probably going to be a high risk pregnancy. But I, you know, failing kind of being able to get into any high risk programs, I thought, oh, I wouldn't mind getting my name on, you know, the potential list. What do, what do you hear about mothers? You know, what are they doing to get onto these programs? Yeah, I mean, you can go on a wait list if you don't qualify initially, but you sort of people make that joke that as soon as you get a positive pregnancy test, so as soon as you pee on the stick, you need to call to try and get into one of these programs. Um, and it just depends how many other women in your area are pregnant at that time and know to call straight away. Um, but people do move in and out of that program for a number of reasons. So you can go on the waiting list and then wait, but it assumes a lot of knowledge. And often once you fall pregnant, particularly if you haven't perhaps planned it, you don't know about these things. You don't know what model of cares, the options there are, and you perhaps just go to your GP and say, what would you recommend? So we're very much encouraging of do your research and empower and educate yourself prior to conceiving 
deceiving, but in reality, that's usually not the case. So people are finding out kind of around eight weeks or later, and then perhaps the the catchment area in the where they're zoned to is already full. So it's definitely tricky, and you have to kind of know someone who knows someone sometimes to to tell you to to be proactive in that way. Or I assume if it's your second pregnancy as well, you might just call your midwife who you had last time if you still got their number, if you were lucky enough to get on the program in the first place. Yeah, I think once, you, once you're once you in the system, it is easier to have subsequent births there. But yeah, and then there's a number of things that qualify you for that too. As you say, you can't be high risk and go through that model usually. And then if things present throughout the pregnancy, which move you into a high risk category, then you might be moved out of that program. But to initially get in when there's limited spots, you really got to call the, the minute you know. <laughs> And what about the lack of access to continuity of care? Let's talk about this idea of doulas and the fact that, you know, that, you know, why are they not subsidized? Let's start with what is a doula? I didn't know what, what a doula was until I got pregnant. Well, most people don't. Um, but a doula is someone um, who supports you throughout your uh, pregnancy and attends the birth. And unlike a midwife who kind of can go or or an obstetrician that can go on or off shift, the doula usually stays with you for that duration. And they, they will often come to your home and support you in the early labor stages. And I think they're incredible. And um, but we just need to note that they're not... Um, they're not sort of regulated under a particular industry. So um, pretty much anyone can kind of create a doula course and certify you as a doula. So I think that is the the big reason why they're perhaps not subsidised by the government. But I think a great kind of bridging there is to have a student midwife and they're free and any midwife who's in training needs to attend a number of births. Um, so there's always midwifery students wanting um to have a, a woman and her family under their care so that they can support them and get their numbers up. But they're, but they're also learning and really um, across all of the kind of terminology and can support you alongside your other care provider. So I think, um, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon that, that we see doulas subsidised, but I think, um, yeah, if money is an issue and you'd like that continuity of care, you perhaps haven't got into that model um, that you are after, then a great bridging is to have a student midwife and, they're, and they tend to be available right across the board because people are always studying midwifery. And you did mention the money there. I mean, the cost for a doula is about 500 to something like 2,500. And we do need to specify, I think it's really important here that they are not medically trained. Uh, they can undertake some study, say through the, the uh, doula college, um, as you've touched on. But I think one of the other important things that, I mean, my doula wasn't with me until after we had the baby. I didn't know about doula services. And I wondered whether you had seen a rise in people using them after birth as well. So for example, I didn't use mine, um, you know, during pregnancy or during birth. It was more about the care and support after, you know, helping me through those initial first weeks. And to be honest, our doula has uh, overstayed and she is um, Mm -hmm. not overstayed. I I love the fact she's stuck around and she's going to be finishing up with us this uh, Christmas. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of my kids almost two. And so they've become part of the family, but the advocacy, that reassurance, I think has been so important for us, particularly as I'm a a woman with disability. Do you hear from women who talk about how invaluable that advocacy for them is from a doula? Yeah, definitely. And as you say, they can be sort of postpartum doulas, which is sounds like what you've um, employed to support your family. And then they can be birth doulas. And I think there's been a huge um, surge in kind of respecting and honoring that postpartum stage now. And it's beautiful just um, to see that evolve and to see women drawing on kind of how other cultures are doing it, because um, really acknowledging and supporting that stage post-birth is done kind of more widely in sort of Asian communities. And I feel like in the Western society, we're drawing on different elements, um, but we're really building up. It it is much, much easier for you to find a postpartum doula and they'll come and do cooking or they'll hold the baby while you have a shower and they, they can do a myriad of things and you sort of interview them and find someone who's a good fit. And it sounds like you found the perfect fit for your house if you don't want to part with it. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I'm so sad she's going to leave. I really am. She's just become part of the family. But uh, it's time for her to go off and, and support other families, which is fantastic. And I think the other thing is she had, she's had she got three boys of her own. So she brought not only her doula knowledge but just her mother knowledge, you know, yeah. the, the, from her own experience, which was beautiful. 
But look, moving on to the next question, um, why aren't home births more widely available? I feel like this is an area where it's still a bit of an uncommon choice, but certainly on the rise. And I wonder if that's sort of happened through COVID, you know, where partners or family members couldn't be at the birth and, and you know, people wanted to kind of have the control they'd lost over the, their lives with the pandemic. Yeah, I think COVID definitely saw an uptick in people sort of seeking out the services to have a home birth predominantly because they were concerned about how many people they could have support them in the birth. And it's some some people unfortunately weren't able to have their partners there, a small number of people. Um, but if you're wanting to have extended family members, siblings, doulas, things like that, then you were restricted by those um, rules for a number of reasons. And then every hospital had a different policy. So I think sometimes people during that stage were like, well, I'll have a home birth and I can control that environment, which is a sense of control and knowing where you're birthing and who's going to support you is so important in the pregnancy um, planning and and sort of visualising your birth. So I think there was a surge there. But um, to have a home birth, and there are more um, independent midwives now offering that service, if you do that uh, just through your own means, you'd be looking at around $6,000, and that's obviously a bit of a sliding scale, but just to give you a ballpark. Um, so it's not cheap. Um, and there are um, more and more home birth publicly funded home birth services coming up. Um, in Victoria, where I'm based, we had a few closed down over um, COVID just um, for a number of policy reasons, but they're reopening and we're seeing a lot more being offered now. And I think that's um, a combination of more demand, but also hospitals recognising that the evidence supports if you have a trained midwife um, and usually a second midwife will come to a home birth as well. That, that the if you have a low-risk pregnancy, that it's a very safe option. It's then taking pressure off the hospital systems. And so it's um, really working in synergy of what women and their families want and also what's best for the healthcare system. So we've also seen um, there's a new uh, home birth publicly funded home birth um, centre opening up in the central coast in New South Wales, whereas there's a really rising number of young families there. So we're seeing them pop up and those public um publicly funded ones then have no charge and it's as if you were going just through a public hospital. So um, the more options we can give um, birthing people and their families, the better. And it's nice to see that sort of being recognised. But yeah, we definitely need it rolled out far wider. And I think regional um, centres don't have access nearly as much as we do in the big cities. Yeah, and look, you did talk about some of the programs there that are available, the publicly funded ones. There are about 17 uh, publicly funded programs for home births across the country, none in Vict uh, none in Queensland or uh, Tasmania. And um, I think it's important to note that the criteria for each of them really varies, doesn't it, Sophie? Obviously, you know, if you're a high-risk pregnancy, you, you, you'd be often cautioned against it, I assume, because the thought would be that you would need access potentially to medical care, hospital-grade medical care. Um, and also, you know, what are you hearing about whether if you live, say, 30 minutes away, um, that you might not necessarily be advised to having a home birth if you're 30 minutes away from a hospital, say. Um, I haven't heard of that specific kind of distance and time frame, but it is um, usually if you're having an independent midwife oversee your home birth, they have um, visiting rights in a neighbouring hospital so that if you did need to make that transfer, that they, you still have that continuity. They'll come to the hospital, check you in and still look after you in a, in a hospital setting. Um, and a number of things can happen in birth, as we all know. So things can um, have a bit of a twist or turn in your journey. So usually when you prepare that home birth, you have kind of an A, B and C plan and, and perhaps plan C is we transfer to the nearest hospital and we know that route and we know that the midwife can, can then support us there. So all of those those discussions are really important and and there is a criteria to make sure that you you and your baby kind of meet the meet the criteria for that particular hospital and that particular model of care. Now this next question uh, I think is quite an interesting one. Um, how does your birth environment affect your labor? Now there was definitely a lot of talk in my mother's group I think there about 15 or 16 of us giving birth in the, you know, in, in the particular kind of mother's group workshop that we did at my hospital. And we all had very different ideas of what our environment should or what we wanted it to look like. Can you talk me through what yours were sort of like? And then we can go to, to I guess, some of the more specifics through the research and I can share with, my, with, with you sort of my experience as well. 
Yeah, I think I always thought I'd have a water birth and I've had three vaginal births and none of them have been in water. So it's funny how you can envisage this certain thing and then I was like, oh, get me out of the bath. This is I not working. I wanted water too and it never yeah. happened. Yeah. It's funny. So, I mean, we always encourage you to have multiple options and, and you never know what you'll feel like. I think if my husband had done any kind of light touch massage on me, I would have hit him. Um, <laughs> so you might think that was a good strategy. And then when the time comes, you're like, don't give me that. So, um, yeah, we you visit in visit a water birth too but didn't yeah. feel like it no oh, well. for, for me it wasn't like that at all it was that w- we had some complications with my placenta and there was some that sort of abnormal function on a 36 week scan so I was admitted straight away after that scan and I had to undergo lots and lots of kind of intense monitoring and then um, you know, my lucky was a breech baby as well, and we'll get to that shortly. Um, but it, there were lots of sort of different factors which led to me having to have a, a an emergency cesarean. So there was no kind of opportunity for that. Um, but you know, I know when I thought about my environment, I was kind of not interested in a playlist. I wasn't interested in the, the scented candles or anything. All I was interested in is I know I've got these complications. I don't know what's going on inside my uterus right now. I just want a baby you know, in my arms as quickly as possible. And so, you know, that was something that played into it for me. I was listening to lots of music, you know, while I was in hospital just for those couple of nights before giving birth to him, just playing myself music and relaxing and doing, you know, um, lots of meditation. But I guess that was my environment. And it does really help you psychologically to stay calm and and all those kinds of things. I wondered, you know, w- w- what do you hear from women about the research around around that? Yeah, well, the main hormone that drives contractions and helps the the labor progress is oxytocin, and that is like the love they call it the love kind of hormone. Yeah. And that um, you need to to encourage that in the birth space. You need to feel safe and warm and cared for and out of danger. And if you go into kind of panic and fight or flight and you kind of lose control, then you can reduce that oxytocin. So we're looking for an environment, and whether that if you're someone who likes crazy loud music and you want to have a power ballad playing while you birth, then that is what's oxytocin driving for you. Um, Personally, I'd prefer something much more low key and more like sounds of waves and things like that. But you need to find um, and plan for what really makes you and your kind of birth team feel nurtured and safe. And I think that kind of draws in of why that kind of continuity of care is so important because if a stranger is walking into the room and saying, oh, I really think you should do this, this and this, and you're like, oh, that's not um, me at all or that wasn't in my birth plan, um, it's not a point in time where you want to bring somebody up to speed on your preferences. And that's why kind of creating that team, that nurtured environment that you can also visualise because I think we've seen in the media where people don't know whether they're hospital is going to be open and whether they have to transfer to another hospital, but being able to kind of envisage the actual room and space you're going to be in, who's going to be there to support you. And then perhaps you've got a bag of tools that you want to draw on, um, on the day, but, but creating an environment which supports the, the natural process of birth. Um, another one is melatonin plays a really important role. And so that's why people often have dim lights or fairy lights. And it's often why we go into labor in the night when you perhaps put other children to sleep and you've gone off duty and relaxed and then <laughs> labor will start or pre-labor. Um, but those kind of hormones, the more you can support the body natural process with those hormones, the more um, conducive it is to having to progressing the labor. Look, this is definitely an area, you know, we should acknowledge that is is well studied, but it does seem to be that, you know, a sense of familiarity, things that you know well, things that you know make you comfortable and things that distract you as well all come into play here. I know for me, particularly not being able to see Um, one of the things that really kept me feeling safe and comfortable and like I was, you know, still in control, even though I was, you know, numb from the waist down in having a cesarean, was just the fact that everyone was still talking to me. They asked me, you know, what, how much did I want to know? They they were, you know, saying things like, you know, this is who I am. This is where I'm going to be standing during the theatre. Um, this is, you know, my role during the procedure. And it made me feel really calm that everyone had taken on board the fact that I wasn't going to see what they were doing or who they were or where they were. And so they took all that into consideration. And I think the one thing we know that is going to help any mother in any birthing scenario is the really person-centered approach, isn't it? 
Yeah, definitely. And I remember from when we recorded your birth story that you also didn't tell anyone else, like it was just you and your partner that knew you were going to have the baby. So I feel like even though you were having a cesarean, you were protecting your birth space and your mental health that no one was like waiting by the phone or anything. You were in that kind of in-between stage of kind of in between two worlds like the baby is almost. It was about not carrying anyone else's mental or emotional load except my own and not even my partners at the time it was sort of like oh we'll deal with you later um (laughs) it was just about this is what me and my baby need at the time and so it's it it was definitely what I needed that that protection feeling that protection space yeah yeah and the start of your own family unit yeah exactly that's right Hey, what are the key differences between private and public care? I think this is the perennial question. Lots of people have it. Um, I know particularly for me, I was considering that if I didn't get onto some sort of midwifery group practice or, or didn't fall in the category of a high risk that I was considering private health because for me, I didn't want to have to go in and explain my disabilities and how it manifests and, you know, to to a new doctor every time I went in for an appointment. I just wanted someone who knew exactly the types of risks and and things that were associated with me and my disability and my pregnancy. So that for me was a factor, continuity of care. But but talk us through the major differences. Yeah. So if you go through the public system, um, you won't pay any money or you perhaps pay a little bit of money for ultrasounds, but generally you don't pay for your care. So the, that's a the very main, important point for some yeah. people. <laughs> so, it can um, cost between 2000 and 20000 I, I read in my yeah, research. So it's, yep, it, it is expensive to go private. Yeah. But, yep. And I went publicly, so I feel like I didn't pay a cent for three, all three of my births, so I feel very lucky. But, um, yeah, so if you go private, you've got more choice and then you're paying. But you need to remember, I feel like a lot of people think, oh, I've got private health insurance, so I'll be covered for maternity. And you really need to read the fine print and make sure that your public, oh, sorry, your private health insurance covers obstetrics and that you've done the correct waiting period before you kind of make a claim or move into that um, That's right. process. It's often a year, a year that you wait, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and they're very um, particular on that. So you need to make sure you've read all that beforehand. Um, but as you say, I think mean, sometimes people pick the private model for that continuity of care, or um, they want, there's a myriad of things that are different. If you're in the public system, you're less likely to have your own room. Um, You're going to have, unless you're in that midwifery group practice, you're going to have a different care provider at each appointment. So you will spend, particularly in your case, Naz, you would have spent quite a bit of that time bringing them up to speed. And those appointments are pretty short anyway. So I feel like you'd get to the end of the appointment, bring them up to speed, and then there's not much time left. So that's exactly um, how I felt. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it sounds like a great decision for you. Um, also, if you're in the public system and you're and you become a high risk patient, um, then you will move into seeing an obstetrician. But that obstetrician is likely to be a different obstetrician at each time, and then um, you're unlikely to know who's going to be on shift when you birth your baby. Um, So people who perhaps haven't gotten into a publicly funded continuity of care model might like to look at private um, or they might like to draw on some of the other things that we sort of touched on, student midwives or doulas. Um, The length of stay in hospital usually varies too. If you're a public patient, um, you might be in a shared room and you might stay two to three nights depending on how busy the hospital is and how your birth unfolded. Um, Whereas if you're in... um, a private model. Some private hospitals, particularly in the city, also have hotel stays. So sometimes you transfer into a hotel, um, a particular floor in a hotel where they actually have midwives and lactation consultants usually on hand to support you. Um, but it's quite a different experience kind of easing you into motherhood in that way. So some people um, make that choice for that as well. And um, yeah, I've been to visit friends in in the Hyatt and things like that. It's very nice, but um, I came straight home to toddlers and right back into it. Look, I, I was in, as I say, the, the high-risk um, uh, sort of midwife program at quite a big public hospital, and for me it was the gold standard of care. I had that same midwife. The other thing that we read a lot about in, in our submissions over the last 12 months with the birth project is that some people who had gone privately felt like, for example, um, you know, that they got that lack of postpartum care and, for example, didn't necessarily get connected with, say, an early childhood or, or, you know, fetal nurse, whereas I was popped into that program straight away. And for me, that was vital in helping me settle back in at home, helping me settle into kind of a, 
you know, a bit of a routine. I hesitate to say that word because um, it changes constantly. But but those sorts of connections I, I felt were very good personally for me. Um, and some people said they didn't necessarily get access to that in the private system. Let's talk a bit about some of the interventions with private versus public. What have you found in the women you've spoken to about that? Um, do you mean the numbers of intervention rates in public yeah. versus private? Yes, and also, for example, you know, you you can have a planned cesarean with private, and if that's the way you'd like to go, then then you know you're more likely to go privately for your birth. Yeah, you can sometimes have more options. I think across the board, it's pretty contentious, and I don't want to lose friends in the obstetric field here. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I think generally, um, yeah, the evidence supports that there is more intervention. I would probably say in the um private system. Um, there's perhaps more inductions. Um, but I think you do have more options. It, it is sometimes you need to argue your case perhaps a little bit more in a public system if you wanted to have, say, an elective caesarean, um, because they'll be um, looking at a number of other reasons, including cost and whether you're a candidate and things. Whereas if you're in um, the private sector, you can pretty much pick and choose within reason um, because you're employing that obstetrician to look after you. Mm -hmm. um, so, the yeah, the options are different. Um, I think that you've touched on a really important point too of that postpartum care because I know with the midwifery um, group practice, I think you and I had that care where they come to your home um, initially the next day after discharge. So I only stayed 24 hours, but I had a, a midwife come to my home the next day and then every two days for um, just over two weeks. So yeah, that's support. Yeah. And um, whereas in the um, private system, you get that longer stay in hospital initially, but then usually you don't present to see your obstetrician till six weeks. And um, we both know a lot happens in those six weeks. It's an overwhelming time. And it's pretty lovely to have your midwife show up on your doorstep every couple of days. And you think, even if you've got a burning question, you can think, oh, well, she's coming tomorrow. I'll ask her or I'll get her to watch her feed or I'll get her to have a look at my stitches. Um, so yeah, that it's a huge point of difference. And I think that is also perhaps why people are looking at getting a private uh, postpartum doula, perhaps if they're going through the private system to to bridge that postnatal gap. But um, yeah, there are quite a few differences and there's pros and cons to both. And then obviously, particularly in this day and age with all the pressures of the cost of living, money is a huge one that usually decides for people. Yeah, absolutely. And really important to note here, I know it can be quite divisive, but really it comes down to what best suits you, your baby and and your family, you know, exactly. structure, isn't it? It's um, yep. whatever whatever you feel is best for you. Um, another really big thing that came up for us in the last 12 months during this birthing project in submissions was this idea of weight stigma. How widespread is, what, is weight stigma in, in birthing? Yeah, it, the BMI is still used, which a lot of people would like to see kind of thrown away. Um, I'm, I should remind people I'm not a midwife, so I haven't cared for women in this way and looked at those um, figures, but it is still brought up. And I think we've talked about it on the podcast where people have felt they've been weighed at every session. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we've also interviewed um, women that have got a history of um sort of eating disorders or they've been um, had issues with obesity and that's really triggering for them to talk about their weight or to bring it up every time. So I think, again, I know we keep talking about it, but the continuity of care and not having those same conversations every time or perhaps being able to flag it with your GP or your care provider initially. We didn't touch on shared care, but some people will go through a shared care model where they see their GP mm -hmm. um, saying, look, for me, I find it really triggering um, to, to really be focused on that weight issue you, and then that can kind of put that issue to bed. Um, however, some hospitals still use it to dictate whether you can have, say, a water birth. They have to be able to, um, I think there's a policy at a couple of hospitals where they need to be able to physically lift you if they need to. And if they feel like you've have gone over a threshold, um, then you won't qualify for a water birth. So I have seen that um, be an issue for people. Again, something really important to discuss your, your kind of hopes and dreams for your birth initially to kind of uncover those sorts of things. Um, but I think, yeah, more and more research is supporting that BMI is not an accurate measure. Um, I know for you, you had gestational diabetes, Naz, didn't you? So did, were you I weighing did. at every appointment or what was it like for you? Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but you do that test for gestational diabetes around 28 weeks. So we didn't actually, you know, it was the first kind of half of the pregnancy where I didn't feel like anything was really an issue with weight or diet or anything like that. But the minute I found out that I had GD, 
I did automatically feel this sense of it's my fault and this sense of shame and also this sense of like, how did this happen? I am I exercise constantly. I mean, I exercised right up until 35 weeks because that what was best, that's what was best for me personally. Um, multiple times a week. I'm a really healthy eater. And I remember saying to my partner, I don't understand. I know people who sit there and just chug down on soft drinks and things. And here I am, you know, having salads and all the things I always have, and yet I've got it. And it's not till you fall pregnant and realize it's actually there's a whole other set of things going on like hormones and you know your body definitely just changes physiologically because of of pregnancy and i can imagine the and and we heard a lot of stories about this around the shame and the disrespect that women felt when they were feeling like they were you know being treated as though they were lazy or that it was their fault um you know and and i i think what's also really um, unfortunate is that those women are automatically just put into, say, a high-risk program where they are managed by a, an OB rather than a midwife, um, you know, and just because their BMI is high um, and obviously we have to acknowledge that, you know, doctors and, and research shows that there are more likely to be some other complications if you have things like obesity, you know, for, for you maternally and neonatally. Um, but just because you have a high BMI, that does not mean that you will necessarily, um, you know, have have a complicated sort of pregnancy. Um, but I think what's important here is to note that women are feeling a sense of shame and um, and blame for this. And, and you know, for example, some research we, we read was that over 50% of women are now experiencing weight issues during their reproductive years, but those women experience at least one related stigma encounter during their pregnancy. That's really, that, that's really terrible. I mean, imagine the psychological pressure on these women. Yeah. And you're so vulnerable and it's almost the beginning of mum guilt, isn't it? You sort of think, oh, it it's because I ate only sausage rolls for my first trimester because it's all I could think of. Um, yeah. yeah, but it's it's hard. And I think the same comes to you suddenly become kind of um, a body that everybody can comment on when people will say, oh, it looks yeah. like you've got twins or it looks like you're carrying small and neither is kind of good for your mental health. But um, suddenly being viewed and kind of looked at in that way is, yeah, it's a lot to take on board. And I think you've you can find a care provider that you um, really have a strong understanding with and a, and a level of respect, then then hopefully then you won't be kind of hit with some of these issues. But as you said, you know, there's nothing you can do with gestational diabetes. Like it's nothing you've done or it's not the kind of 10 packets of biscuits you ate in the first trimester. It's a, it's a chemical thing. <laughs> It is. And look, really important to note there that obviously, you know, doctors have said that uh, things like weight, you know, weight and obesity obviously need to be addressed, but it's certainly complex and, and nuanced. And, um, you know, so that's all really important to remember when, when we're talking about a, a very um, layered issue like this, isn't Definitely. it? Definitely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And what happens when things get complicated? So if we think about breach or, or multiples, I've got the experience of, of breach where there was sort of discussions around should we turn, should we not, um, you know, and in the end I personally made the decision my baby had been, you know, breached since 20 weeks. We were now at 36. Let's just get this show on the road. I wasn't afraid personally of a cesarean. I just wanted to have my baby in my arms. But for many women they don't. Let's talk a little bit about breach first. Have we almost seen an, an end to breach vaginal births? It's pretty sad. It feels like sometimes it's scary, like it's a dying art because I think when hospitals don't um, offer it or don't kind of suggest it, it's because they don't feel um, they've done enough to feel a, a you performed enough breach vaginal deliveries to feel confident to support you. And um and there's some incredible obstetricians in uh, New South Wales, Dr. Andrew Bissett's like training as many people as he can before he retires really to try and keep people feeling like it is a variation of um, another variation of birth and it doesn't necessarily have to be kind of seen as a high risk. Um, it's just a deviation of normal. And the more that we can kind of train midwives and obstetricians to support that mode, the better. There is also other reasons why, and I'm not sure if this is something you felt in your heart. And I know a lot of women I've spoken to have said well if the baby's been in this position for however long maybe there's a reason like maybe it has a shorter me. cord or maybe <laughs> it fits better there and maybe we don't want to disrupt that so I mean the most important thing is it's women-centered care and your family is looked at and you discuss what feels right for you so if you're there are people that really 
are very much um, set on wanting to have a vaginal breach delivery if that's the way their baby is presented. And then they um, could be scurrying around. I think people often message me and say, who do you know that does it and which hospital does it and things like that. Um, Whereas other people will be like, I don't even want to try an ECV. I just want to let the baby be where it will be and we'll have a cesarean. So again, it's about just doing your research. Um, But I mean, it is sad to think that perhaps if you want to have a vaginal breech birth in your hospital or your zone zoning, there's just no one there to support that. Um, And you do need someone who's done it before and is trained because there's a few different things that you do. Obviously they're coming out in a different way um, and you need to know how to manage that and support that. So um, yeah, it's sad to think that due to your location, you might miss out on that ac- that kind of access. Um, but that's kind of where we are at at the moment. And we're really just hoping that doctors such as Andrew Bissett's, um can teach as many people as possible so that p- women have choices and options. Yeah. And look at some of the stats, uh, three to five percent of babies are born breech. Ninety percent of breech babies are born by C-section. And, you know, I know in, in some of the research that, you know, one of the kind of complications is that, you know, they are bottom first. So there could be some issues with with the head, um, you know, being injured, I, I think, is the is the main one of one of the reasons anyway. Why yeah, there's categories of, of whether you're a good candidate for a mm. vaginal breech birth delivery as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And why does no one tell you about prolapse? But up to fifty prolapse, sorry, but up to fifty percent of women develop that condition postpartum. This is something me and my friends never talked about, and I feel like we definitely should have a lot earlier in our lives. Can I give you just some statistics? So one in three struggle to control their bladder. One in 10 struggle with fecal incontinence and one in two experience pain during sex. Now, that's some of the things that can occur if we don't manage this properly um, that that can lead to after birth. Talk to me about pelvic floor injuries. Yeah, I think I'm an outlier there because I'm always telling everyone about my prolapse. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I've got one myself. But I think initially when I was um, told I had one, I was like, oh, this is like an old woman's issue. Surely um, I'm like in my 30s and what does this mean for, and for future births and things? And it's embarrassing to talk about. Yeah, it's not something we talk and, about. And you want to talk about it everything. I feel like we're only just overcoming the stigma of talking about menstruation and periods. Um, so kind of incontinence of any, any of if fecal or urine isn't really widely discussed until you tell one friend and they're like, oh yeah, I've got it too. And then you find out everybody's going through that. Um, but I think in the same way that there's a sort of surge in kind of embracing postpartum and postpartum doulas and support, I feel like there's a surge now in people understanding their pelvic floor and knowing that throughout pregnancy, it's a really, um, we really encourage you to go and see a women's health physio who can tell you kind of um, how to do your pelvic floor exercise. It's not just kind of holding everything in and holding your breath, um, which I think people kind of think it is. Um, And there is a real importance to being able to release and relax your pelvic floor. So having an understanding of where you're at in your pregnancy can really support the way you actively birth and your recovery and how you manage that. So um, I think we're seeing a shift there. The the biggest kind of hurdle really is – perhaps education and people knowing to access those services, but they're very, very expensive. And I know mine were all out of pocket. You get a small rebate, but you often need to go and see a women's health physio um, sort of a minimum, I'd say, of six times perhaps post-birth. And, um, yeah, it's not cheap. It can kind of start from 100 and go up to kind of two or 300. Mm-hmm. Um and if you're going multiple times and you're kind of trying to get there with a newborn, it's really, really difficult. So it's hard for women to um, prioritize that financially and and kind of time wise. But it's really important for to kind of stop those long term injuries. There is a call from the Australian Physios Association as well for um, you know five Medicare subsidized trips to a women's physio in the woman's childbearing year as well. So um, you know um, many people are sort of uh, you know waiting the outcome of that. But I know personally for me, I saw a women's physio after lots of encouragement from friends who had already had kids before, after, and it was incredibly beneficial. And it's the first thing I tell anyone now when they tell me I'm pregnant. It's one the first things I'll tell them. Sophie Walker, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom, your experience, and the stories of the thousands of women you have spoken to on your podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, so lovely to talk to you, Naz. Thank you. Thanks.